college education. I'm not a computer science graduate by background. I was an aerospace engineer. Started out in natural physics, moved into aerospace engineering, computational fluid dynamics. But that, that was my college, right? And so one of the interesting things to me, just about the software industry, is it's an industry where a lot of people who've been successful in it don't necessarily come from the traditional background and from that curriculum as an undergraduate degree. And there's actually a, sort of a reason for that in my mind, and that, that kind of goes through the, the story here. But, um, you know, I got out of school, I worked at NASA, um, one of the biggest companies you could possibly work for as an engineer. You know, 10,000 people building rockets. And that wasn't exciting to me. Uh, you know, I felt very small and, and not really contributing in a big way, even though I was part of NASA, which is really cool. And when I was a kid, that was what I wanted to do. But, um, you know, when I got there and it was working, you know, it wasn't fulfilling in terms of that individual role. So I started out looking for how could I have a bigger impact as an engineer? How could I wake up every day and feel like, you know, I built a lot of things, I made things happen, you know, my, my efforts really impacted the world, or at least I saw some change happening. So that led me to software and startups, right, both sides of it. So uh, the transition out of uh, NASA got me into, um, you know, just luckily a startup called Trilogy that we were at for a while down in Austin, Texas. So that was the first sort of startup experience I had in software experience I had. But I was lucky I joined a guy who dropped out of Sanford Junior. Uh, so classic startup story, the crazy startup guy. Um, but Joe basically knew a lot about the industry, had a lot of very good people around him, and it gave me the opportunity, joining that early in that company, to build software from scratch, to think like a product manager, because I was exposed to everything that uh, the company was doing in terms of trying to define a product and make money. And then as we grew, luckily this was a company that was very successful, so as we grew, I got to build teams, see how teams operated successfully, and kind of go through the whole lab experiment up to, uh, we were about 1,500 people and 250 million in revenue. So when I walked in the door, there was nothing, and that was kind of the trajectory. So, you know, that was obviously a very forming experience in my career, just to make that transition and kind of see all of that. So then I took those lessons and said, all right, you know, what do I want to do next? That was successful. Yeah, yeah, so I think uh, a couple of things. I think Joe was really, really early on, who was the founder, in um, a very customer-centric approach to how you engineer built software. This was pre-internet. I know to a lot of people out here in the crowd, that, that may be a very boring concept. But, um, you know, this was an era of enterprise software, right? So what Trilogy built was software to help Fortune 500 companies to sell their products better and kind of reduce error rates. So not sexy gaming apps or websites. But even in that endeavor, we really tried hard to understand who the customer was to get to that person inside the enterprise and to make sure that the engineers, the people who were actually writing the software, were exposed directly to those people and heard the requirements directly. So we were doing sort of an early version of Scrum before Scrum was a concept, right? We just had this intuition that this was the right way to do things. And since none of us had a classical background, it wasn't like we were doing this with a textbook. This was just kind of our, you know, our gut feel of how we would do it right if we were engineers. So that's something that stuck with me in my career for sure, is being in industries where you could be close to the customer, not very three layers back, and not put, you know, organizational groups between uh, the engineers and the ultimate customer at the end. Um, you know, other lessons there were around you want to create value early. Uh, so, you know, when you when you look at your product and you're starting to build it, don't stay on a whiteboard and what you wish the market would do. Very quickly get out to the market and work with these customers and make them pay for the product you're building. That's what's going to validate: Am I on the right track? Am I doing the right thing? So, very incremental approach to how you create value and add value to your product as you're growing your company. Yeah, so living.com, so that was an interesting one. So <coughs> dot com here came, right, and, and the internet, and that was exciting. And so I was way at the front end of that. So at Trilogy, we, we built a, a very early website, totally in Perl, right? There were no languages, there wasn't anything, there wasn't an app server. 
you're literally writing scripting on the back end and hoping it would work on a Linux box. And then if a million people came, yeah, that didn't scale too well. But you know, we built some very sophisticated technology on top of this. We weren't just building you know basic um, publishing site or you know basic website. We had built a system where people could come and configure and build computers. Uh, very sophisticated computers and then buy them, right? So we were part of this computer industry. We understood sort of the engineering complexity. And at the time, this was the era where you could buy separate motherboards and CPUs and memory and put it all together and have a computer. Um, and a lot of people did that. So, you know, sophisticated business logic and, and technical logic on the back end of the system in that early internet era. So that got me excited about the internet. Um, that was a trilogy, but then when I left trilogy, we did living.com, which was more of the classic, oh, we're gonna be retailers. We're gonna go out on the internet, we're gonna make a billion dollars, the world's gonna be great. So uh, this was benchmark funded, Dave Byrne, as, who was one of the darlings of the era there, uh, mm -hmm. who threw a lot of money at it and said, how fast can you build one of the biggest uh, e-tailer type companies in the world? Amazon was probably about two years in at this point. They were just starting to ramp in revenue, but we're talking 50 million in revenue, not where they are today. But you know, the, the VCs had their eye on this and said, oh, you know, e-tailing is going to happen, and we want to build four more companies like this. So if we can pump money in fast enough, can we build companies fast enough? So the lesson there was, you know, they wanted us to build this entire very complex company in about 18 months. And they had all the money in the world, right? So they said, right, you know, here's 120 million bucks, and it was over a couple of funding rounds, but we had access to that. So you ought to be able to build an entire company in that amount of time, right? It's never that easy, right? So what I, I took the lesson because, A, I could build a lot of cool technology with some of that money, that, that was fun. Uh, but B, it was like a lesson in how fast can you grow a company, and if you try to grow really fast, what are the problems that happen? So, you know, we did a lot of outsourced engineering um, and trying to get the groups to communicate and coordinate together was obviously one of the large problems that we had. Every, but we architected the system so that everybody owned their own module. There was a clear functional unit to what any team built so that there wasn't necessarily daily interaction between the teams and that allowed each of the teams to move fairly fast, but you still, moving at that pace, the teams got out of sync. When they got out of sync, the software obviously didn't integrate well, and then you ran into problems. So, but on the engineering side, I think you know we actually built a very high scale, you know, one of the better recognized websites of that era. The challenge became, okay, as we're building this technology really fast, the business is trying to adopt and become a retailer. So we took a bunch of people out of classic retail, stuck them on top of this. We're running as fast as we can as engineers. And all of these people who were Macy's, um, you know, basically buyers, <laughs> probably never seen a computer, were our merchanting arm, right? So they were the people picking the products that we were going to put online, figuring out how to put them in a database. So those teams that really didn't move as fast technically couldn't stay synchronized with how fast we were moving. And we didn't get good requirements from our customer on the inside, the, this back end side was trying to fill and build this catalog. And then of course the internet, we didn't actually have the customers yet, so we're guessing at the product we're trying to build, right? So those are just impediments that no matter how much money you throw at it, you can't fix it in one month or two months. Um, so, you know, we, ultimately the company did well, got online, sold a lot of product uh, and, and the funding was the problem. We couldn't scale the, the revenue, the actual customer adoption fast enough for you know the money that we had spent. So consumers will adopt in time and there was this cycle of you know merchants had to put product online, and then they had to learn from the customers, you know, what products did you build when I put this online? And, and if you didn't buy, why why did you buy? Right? So this was also the early stage, it wasn't a huge you know, sort of uh, analytical system on the back end. So, you know, they had very basic reports, but they were trying to learn from their customer, and that just takes time. There's no amount of technology you can pour in that just, you know, in two months can make you find a customer base, know them well, serve them well, have the right products online at the right price, right? The beauty of Amazon is it's been around now for, what, you know, 
15 years, you know, I mean, they just continually learn about that. They, we had a phase where, where basically the investors who would try to monetize it anyway, they could said, hey, can we take the software and sell that, right? Turn it into a software company and kind of leave the ETL behind. But ultimately, and this was just a lesson in BC, right? They were married to the original model that they put together. We probably could have viably done that. There was a company that came out of this that I actually went to work for several years later because of the relationship, ATG. So our technology group. So we actually were the company that helped them build their entire uh, e-commerce engine on that system. We shared code with them. <laughs> so was, you know, we're kind of building half of their technology in the stack. But uh, you know, so there was a viable play. To, to take this thing and, and go become a software company, become a really viable business, but the VCs just could not unwind the way they invested the company and pivoted, and therefore it was really a pretty abrupt stoppage. Right? There was no four phases of change. It was just look, you know, we didn't make it. The, the customers didn't come fast enough. We're shutting it down. You got to figure a lot of things out yourself. So as CTO, I like to figure it out. Right, so I'll sit down there and try to build a first prototype that is broad, but obviously not complete, or not deep. Um, and then we hire, you know, two or three engineers who are my leads who come in, and then we start to build the software more commercial scale. We put in all the continuous integration components and make sure that we have a good software engineering process. And they learn the domain, and then we parcel up the work and start to you know, subdivide and, and kind of build a services-oriented architecture, right? Allow each engineer to kind of own a complete functional service so they can move at the fastest pace they can, but there's always a contract or an API for how they communicate and how they integrate with each other. And that is really key. Like, full-stack developers is what I always look for, right? That's the early stage. It's like finding these people who have thought through all the layers and can think architecturally along with me. Very important. Yeah. So, so how did you like uh, manage reuse or knowledge transfer across teams or did you reserve that for later? Yeah, that's a good question to start up. You want to do that every day, but you, you, you generally end up doing that a little later. Um, so that's where I think being a CTO, you, you, you got to give on some things. Uh, you know, there's kind of lifeboat economics in a startup. You can't do everything. Um, so you want to take that to a point, but you obviously want to find where the breaking point is. So there's there's cycles in engineering where, okay, I'm going to run and build a lot of feature and functionality, right? And that's going to make the investors happy, and it's going to get a first version product out, and it's going to get our website launched. But then you want to find a time when you can pull back and say, okay, for three months, we're not going to do that now. And you have the highest moral capital when you just launched that product. <laughs> So you get a set of functionality out, you make sure it works, you get your success, you kind of sell that to everybody, the investors, your CEO, and you know everybody's using the system inside the company, and then you have a little bit of time. And so you've got to use that time wisely. So then you back up and you do a cycle of, okay, let's do some cross-functional knowledge sharing, let's do some documentation, let's, let's think through the architecture. So you've got to do those cycles, but you, you just can't do them every day. So, so this probably, you know, we'll talk about place I keep later, but I mean, this, this is a good part to talk about. So three years ago, big data, right? Oh my God, you got to use a NoSQL data store, right? Because that's the only way you ever use big data. So that was the one that was confronted with me when I sat down and thought about that system the first time. And there are two sides to it. I could, I could kind of draw a picture of how much data we were going to have as a company by year two or three when we were really successful. And oh yeah, that's daunting. And, you know, some of these issues that the NoSQL platforms were describing that they could handle was very attractive. But then I stepped back and said, hey, but here it is, it's year one. Um, we really don't have that much data. That's not my problem today. Uh, so I'd rather explore the domain and understand the domain better, and I'm gonna push that problem off until year two. So we built the first version of the system on Postgres. This it works. Uh, got a lot of experience in it, could write things really fast, was much more efficient, and I knew if I thought that, you know, this was three years ago, Cassandra or you know, some of the newer stacks, I'd be fighting bugs or fixing their code half the time, versus actually working on my domain and solving the problems that are going to make my company more valuable. <laughs> so, 80% of the time, I'm going to choose the try and true, and you try and push off these other problems 
to as late as you can in the cycle. And that's also an interesting discussion because you know some people will say, oh my god, you never want to re-engineer, you never want to redesign, and that's a failure of the engineering organization. I had to manage my uh, my co-founder at a place like you because I told him, I think we'll rebuild this thing probably three times along the way because there's so many unknowns and this is such a complicated system and we don't have money. So there's all sorts of constraints on people, money, uh, your own skills and experience, right? You can't build it right the first time. So don't try. You know, just kind of look at the problems that are going to be in front of you in the next 12 months. Pick tools and capabilities that allow you to be successful there. And then, you know, live to fight another day. And, uh, you know, on the NoSQL side, I also had sort of a, and this is something to do with CTO, you know, is, is it really going to be the new vendor who ultimately succeeds here? Or, or are they going to have a big bang for the first two years while this is the hot new technology? But then Postgres is going to come in, you know, Vertica is going to come in, everybody else is going to come in and actually kind of figure this out. And there's going to be other ways to handle the big data flow into large enterprises. Probably so. So I also try to let those problems maybe solve themselves because one of my jobs is to make sure I can't solve every problem, right? I'm not going to get enough funding to do that. Um, so I got to pick my battles and sometimes create constraints that say, look, I do not want to be the one solving that problem and therefore I'm going to wait for that problem to get solved before I add it into how I you know, adopt the technology into my company and solve the problem for my customers. So. In this current gig, I mean, I think it's back to the answer a little while ago, which is um, focus on one thing at a time. Don't try to do everything at once. And so the, the, the earlier discussion was around, you know, the velocity of feature versus stability and maintainability and scalability. But I also look at it with all these factors. Like, you know, I, I tend to focus and, and try to make major progress in one of the legs of the stool. Often, so if it's performance, so you just find in the business, and performance was our problem, right? To this discussion, we just had thumbtack. I needed a, 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 an appliance that would serve at that scale, so we could make enough money off this product that we built. So okay, the theme for the next month and a half is performance and scale, right? You know, that's something I'm I'm focused on. I'm spending a lot of my time on to find thumbtack to build this project right to get them set up so that they can be successful and ensure that that happens. So. So it's not necessarily you have performance issues, but it's redirect the whole team to, to focus on performance in the next two months and sort of figuring out the best of the other. Yeah, no. So we tend to do sometimes, just have to say. Because so other parts of the team are, I'm just not as hands on with them at that time. Okay. So you got to let things run a bit. <laughs> Well, you're, you know, you got to figure out where you need to spend time to make progress. Because again, that's that whole, you know, in a startup, there just aren't enough hours in a day. Uh, so for you as one person to try and solve it all. Uh, so, you know, some things may not go totally the direction you want them to go, but you got to trust people you have there, um, and you got to let them kind of run. So, so usually you, would it be fair to say you usually pick one thing that you truly, truly focus on, yeah. and you just sort of say, like, that's the team I'm spending a lot of time in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you know, for at least a a month it will be the primary focus. I mean, it's not that you don't do anything else, not myopic, but that's the one that you're really trying to make progress on. Everything else you're trying to at least keep going <laughs> while you're trying to make real progress in one key area. And you usually communicate this to the executive team to make sure that the like, next month I'm performance focus, next month I'm trying to increase the uh, onboarding of cons consultants yep. or using the language and whatever. Exactly. Okay. And you help them understand the rationale. Here's why I'm focused on that now and why it's the most important thing for us all. She has a vision as to where you're going. Yeah, yeah, sure. So the next factual progression is, yeah, we were data scientists. We kind of ate our own dog food. We built our own platform that, you know, did this science in a pretty custom novel way that nobody's really ever thought of before. So at first we're just arbitrage, right? We take the out the, the finished product and we go sell that to customers, they pay us a lot of money, that's, that's great. But now we're starting to see the customers are coming to us saying, well, I've got some proprietary data, I don't necessarily want you to do the data science because I'm not going to share this information with you, it is sensitive data, therefore I need to bring a platform into my enterprise and then teach my people how to use it and then you know, they can do business. So we're, we're now looking at how do we build an analytical platform 
that can be delivered either you know somewhat by cloud, but also because of the proprietary nature of, of some of this data that's going to have to be inside these companies, so that they can just do this themselves. So, so basically, you're kind of building a platform as a service development platform, at least that division. Yeah, we're even looking at this platform as a service. Even if it got deployed inside the data center, it would be a SOA module, right? Something that you plop into that data center that runs, right? It connects up to their whole infrastructure and provides a service to them. Uh, maybe just a couple of use cases that the technology enables. Yeah. So the you know the big one we're making money off right now is, is mobile advertising, right? So it's all around in real time when you're using your app and it's an ad-driven application. Uh, a lot of them are location based, and they'll pass the location, and that's the only piece of information we use to do these predictors. To say you're a college student or you'd be interested in food right now or. You're probably shopping for you know high-end clothing, um, so we just know all these behaviors, and that's that's kind of the kind of profiling and, and segmentation that we do on the phone. So, so you kind of look at people's behavior and from there you deduce the likelihood to be in a certain demographic, which gives you gives you ability to do other things. Is that right? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, to get a little more detail, not too detailed. Um, so we'll take this information, we break the world up into uh, 100 meter tiles. Uh, so in North America there's a billion 100 meter tiles. So that's the resolution we're at versus zip code targeting or, you know, kind of old school marketing. So we're orders of magnitude more detailed. And what pops out when you get to that level of detail is, you know, the real behaviors and predictions and repeatable patterns that people have. Most people are creatures of habit, right? They visit the same places every day. They kind of walk the same paths. They tend to repeat themselves. So it becomes predictive pretty quickly. And then you see, you know, so therefore behaviors become repeatable as well. And by behaviors, I mean like, you know, people searching for Chinese food restaurant, right? Or people are hungry here. People are going out to a bar here. People are, you know, looking for a movie. Um, so people's behavior is going to try it. Right, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, that's the maps we build, right? We build these maps, we have these, these behaviors understood, we contextualize them in terms of, of sort of the location as well, and that allows us to propagate the model out beyond the people we learn from. So there's a set of people we learn from, right? It's like, oh, these interesting behaviors happen. Then we figure out the sort of location characteristics that are influencing or predicting that type of behavior. And then we see we can replicate that throughout North America because we have the entire map, right? We know where all the businesses are and where all the location characteristics are. So now I can cover all of North America through not, you know, I don't have to study every person in North America to understand every person in North America. I can train on this. We had angel funding, one million dollars, uh, basically dumping myself and uh, the, the first employee who started with us, who was a, a DBA and a, a location analytics type of person, so he understood GIS data, which was our first problem, we were just getting data, we needed to store it and structure it. Um, and then we had a, a sort of a functional analyst, a market uh, uh, employee number two, who was, you know, she'd been in marketing and she kind of understood a little bit of the customer space, or at least the idea of marketing segmentation. So kind of our first proxy for customer understanding. Um, and then uh, I hired one data scientist at that time. Uh, so did you, did you just start out with a million dollars of funding? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And so we spent the first year, year and a half just working with the data. And didn't want to grow the team at all because we were just exploring and trying to understand what we're doing. Um, Sure, it would limit the amount of exploration we could do, but to hire more people would create noise as well. So we want to be kind of focused. So if you were fairly explicit with your investors, this is how we're going to be using the money, and so we will be studying this and give you some research output or whatever? Yeah. And so the early phase was we could prove, we could ingest a lot of data, we could cleanse it, we could put it on a map, we could, you know, so A, we got access to the types of information we would need. B, we seem to know how to store it and manage it. And C, we could run some kind of algorithm on top of it. We didn't yet know if it was the right algorithm, you know, the, the million or billion dollar algorithm, but at least we we're starting to do data science on top of the data. So that was a good enough proof point in the first phase. And then, uh, you know, we got was our- that, Was that 
was that the most fun? Yeah, no, writing code is definitely the most fun. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I guess, so we'll, we'll come back to this in a second. How do you use, how, how do you write any code now? And how do you make sure that you stay fresh? Because you sort of seem to come back to earlier stage stuff, mm -hmm. which means that you sort of need to be able to come back to writing code and presumably being pretty good at it. If you're spending yeah. a year as the first coder, like, right. you don't want to be too rustic. How do you balance that? Yeah, I, I haven't written code. I mean, you know, a little, a little fun stuff on the side, but I haven't written code in a year. So there are times when you get too busy and you move on and you're like beyond that. So I, I mean, that's why, again, I like the four year cycles because then I can get back to coding. Spend at least one to two years coding and one to two years scaling. You know, uh, I, would, I would be nervous to get much further away from it than that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that was the first phase. That was just us. Uh, and then we got Series A funding and moved to New York. This is where the customers were, or at least that's what we, our premise was, marketing was our customer. And I decided to hire one more data scientist, and I hired a triple PhD mathematician, because I knew we were gonna do a lot of algorithms. So, could optimize the hell out of anything and model things. My, my data scientist, by the way, was a um, applied physicist, which is a couple of key areas I like, but like, People who can take mathematics and model complex systems, whether they model biology or the early universe or something, that's the domain they've worked in. So they've already got this discipline and this kind of comfort around math and using math to describe really complex problems and all the various permutations of how I might go about that versus Again, you know, sort of some, somebody coming out of maybe a master's, PhD, comp sci, machine learning person. You know, that's a different type of data scientist to me. So I didn't focus so much on, you know, is this robotics and is this machine learning, right? In the classic comp sci sense, as I know there's a mathematical problem here. And I'm going to have a set of data, I'm going to reduce it and model it in some way, and then I'm going to use some math to be able to correlate and extract and understand. Were you worried to hire the triple PhD guy that he's going to be sitting around and doing math and not actually producing? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and so you know that's part of the part of the interview is uh, he coded. Okay. And so the nice thing too, he he, um, he was Yale PhD physics, uh, studying the early universe. But then he went to a hedge fund. So he did finance, which showed that he shipped every morning. His stuff had to work, and if his algorithm broke down, you know people lost millions of dollars. So he'd actually been on the action side of this. And he's interested, he was, and this is another important thing, he was interested in software. I also didn't want a data scientist who was theoretical and had no interest in writing software. Because you get these types of cultures where it's thrown over the wall. You know, I modeled everything in MATLAB or R, and here you go, so like, yeah, now it's just software. Like, you guys go build some software that does that. So I wanted to make sure that in the beginning of this process, there was a lot of linkage between data science and software, and thinking about the full manifestation of that algorithm, not just the theory of the algorithm. And so, and so very pragmatic guy, absolutely. Cool. All right, so. No, so we're basically a number crunching backend system, so all of our testing systems are pretty simple, right? It's stream the data at it and do the diff on the back end. So, yeah, we don't have sort of the, that UI or behavioral or kind of front end piece of the world. There's all experiences. Yeah, yeah. So, what we do is our data scientists are the key guys. So, we'll test it at several levels. One is just, is the algorithm implemented correctly, which is kind of like a math test. But it says, okay, did you just mess up the basic function, right? Um, and then you have a set of data that says, oh, if I ran through that function, I would expect the result to be X. So, it's kind of the, you know, the test and truth set that we use. So we can always get the expected result out of that. Then we know if there's drift in any of the algorithms that we have going. So it's not actually sophisticated testing. It's just that you've got to put the effort into testing. And you, you, know, you have to think through a, a decent enough, you know, creating a test data set is actually the interesting problem. Because again, back to the one where I got caught, right? It's like, okay, the sample data was so far from reality, it missed like 10 or 11 major problems that we were <laughs> into, so, yeah, yeah, um, 
Yeah, I actually haven't thought about it. I mean, I'm so immersed in what I'm doing that it's truly the answer that, but, but I believe I'm in the middle of something that it's always adjacent, right? It's not like I just jump way, way out of bounds. So the thing I like about what we're doing in a place like here is we're immersed in everything that's happening in the mobile consumer cycle, which is the biggest cycle that's ever happened, bigger than the internet, right? The amount of people who are on smartphones versus the amount of people who adopted the internet globally is a pretty amazing trend. The intimacy and the amount they're using that device is amazing. So it's not just about e-commerce um, and YouTube. Uh, so I, we really, you know, we're in a 10 year cycle here. I mean, I'm just fascinated by that. I'm in the middle of it and I get to see all of that and to chew on all that data. Um, you know, there, so as we build this platform, hopefully we're gonna help disrupt multiple areas even within, right? You know, not, not a separate company. So maybe that's my goal in this one. Maybe this is the first one I can last it for more than four years. Coming up on four years, I gotta, I gotta figure it out. At some point, I'm gonna hold a job for six years, eight years. <laughs> that's key for everybody is you gotta know your blind spots. So for me, the, the process and people side, I'm not a manager of people. Um, that's just not what I want to do every day. I, I, I never got managed. I actually was self-managed, so I, I kind of created my own career and kind of nobody ever directly managed me as, as in this job I'm in. Um, there were my network and people I talked to, but it wasn't like this active, you know, two-year manager, leader person. So I don't have success models of that. I didn't create myself that way, so I think I'm probably pretty bad at doing it. <laughs> So I look for, okay, I need balance as we're going to grow a bigger team and people are going to need feedback on a continual basis and kind of growth and, you know, understanding, um, uh, you know, I need somebody who's, who's focused on those types of things. So I look for somebody who's my partner who kind of complements my weaknesses slash not my areas of complete interest and, and they balance. And it's not that it's less valuable and meaningful and necessary, it's that that's a balance, you know, I want to spend more of my time thinking about how do I kind of design the company to do these things that are disruptive and make sure they're valuable and they actually work and kind of carve through the big problems that the organization has. So I work cross-discipline collaboratively to evolve an entire organization, but that's different than being a manager who every day has to say, okay, who gets a raise this month and, you know, who, who needs you know, to go to a class because they need to be a little better at Java or Hadoop or whatever, right? So you know, that's just an example. And then you know, technologies, again, are blind spots for me, so I've got to find people who help me. I understand functionally, I haven't done a lot of different things, but you know, I'm now at a level that's kind of above all of that, and somebody you know, is much deeper than me, much better. You know, Kevin, our employee number one, is by far our DBA and Postgres guy. Stan is definitely my Hadoop guy, so I always end up finding the chief architects, the, the leaders inside our organization who technically own their piece of the stack. Well, there's, there's simple stuff. So what motivates you and excites you? Why do you start with each company? Every, every new company and why do you do your job every day? Yeah. Uh, like I said before about every other engineer, I want to be challenged. Yeah, and that's, that's when I leave is when I get bored. When I get bored, I'm gone. Uh, so, yeah, it's gotten to the point where I guess it's addictive crack and now I have to be at the very front of a startup that's like, we don't know anything. <laughs> Everything's a challenge. Every day you wake up, you're like, oh my God, I don't know how to do 10 things. I don't know how I'm going to get through the day. But really, it is that, you know, I feel, you know, the motivated and energized by, I've got to learn something. Uh, or make something work that isn't easy either for me or, or nobody's ever done it before. So yeah, it's all about just, you know, continually being challenged and working with great people because I'm not, I don't want to be in a closet and do that myself. I actually want to do that through a large organization where we get together a great set of people and, and figuring out how to put together data scientists and software engineers and marketers to solve this problem is interesting. So the, the problem isn't just software, software and algorithm, it's, you know, it's bigger than that. 
So it, you know, ultimately we want to get there. The question is, are we going to go to Europe with our analytics and technology? Uh, U.S. is a huge marketing market. So to build a billion dollar company, we can do it here. Um, but most of the companies we work with do business over there, so they're going to be wanting us to do it anyway. Uh, so we'll get there, but we're not pushing it. We're letting our customers push it. Um, and there are challenges, right? So some of them are cultural behavioral because these models are about your consumption patterns and you know, Europeans' behaviors are different. Their preferences are different. So that will change the models. And so there will be a level of, we have to get some data scientists who have some of that cultural knowledge. It matters. Um, and then we have to build these models. We'll be much faster and more efficient, but we are gonna have to build them and they are gonna be different. Um, and data relationships. So some already has purchased, some of it's free, some of it has varying quality. So we're gonna have to get data from different sources to have the same coverage and set of assets we need. So there's also some work to be done there. So yeah, it's not a, it's not a, a super simple challenge. It takes some time. Uh, you know, I didn't architect to, to like be a CTO, uh, and in some ways, I don't even necessarily want to be the leader or the guy. Um, I just like art problems and interesting things, and I like to have control of that. So I think the controlling factor probably led to it. But um, you know, just be a good engineer, work on really interesting challenges, then the success will come. All right, if you're if you're actually building good people around you and you know working on the process, working on the technology and, and, and you get three or four or five wins and you get networks of people that you know, um, good things happen. So to me it's just about that. You know, and, and if you're interested in you know being an engineer, uh, you know, just being around other engineers who are great is a good thing. And and being around people who are better than you. That's another thing for me is like, uh, I think I got better because I was not afraid to always have people better than me, reporting to me or not. Like at Nuance, I had 80 PhDs reporting to me. I'm like, that's insane. Like, how, how does that even work? You know, like, and it's like, every one of them is smarter than me. But, um, you know, so I learned a lot. I, I look at that as an opportunity, right? It's, and that's great. So, you know, I look for organizations and groups and places where you're just surrounded by people who are going to challenge you every day and be great, but then, you know, good things will happen. Do you feel that you can bring sort of all of the experience that you had over your career into sort of every role that you go in? Like, does it get sort of easier in a way with time? Obviously, you were continuing on with that in terms of working on different types of problems, but do you feel you sort of become more equipped over time to make sort of the more correct decisions at the correct time? Yeah, you know, I think it's such a hard problem, right, doing a startup that uh, you never feel that you're good because you're always going to make a mistake, lots of mistakes, tons of mistakes. Um, I try not to make the same mistakes. That's useful. Um, but yeah, I've been surprised because I actually thought it would get easier. Maybe this is depressing for everyone. <laughs> it's like, it's like, yeah, it doesn't get easy. You know, I mean, that's where I think, you know, people who maybe stay in that same role and kind of replicate, you know, that I, I'm a disciplinarian in this vertical, you can probably architect where it gets easier. Um, but where you just go out on the crazy edge, it's pretty crazy every time. So I get back on this question, but sort of you, you've observed like, basically like these two big shifts mm -hmm. in technology. Internet and mobile. Yeah. Can you sort of maybe talk about what you've observed? Do you feel that there's just sort of certain fundamentals that are violent, or do you see that actually, you know, we are like 10 times more productive than we used to be you know, 50 years ago? As people, just because as, of this? As developers, as developers. better tooling, better infrastructure. Yeah, do, no, so do you yeah. feel that, or, uh, or do you think like it's yeah. still pretty fun? <laughs> <laughs> it's still pretty hard. So, like, one of my answers. So, from the AI background, uh, you know, there, there's all those the people who say we're two years away from computers being equal to humans, and then there's people who are like, a computer will never be a human. I'm much closer to a computer will never be a human. 
uh, as a programmer, knowing how when you just write an algorithm and try to get it right, <laughs> it's a simple, single algorithm, you know, that replicating the full human brain seems kind of hard. So, you know, I mean, that, and that's the endless end game of where we think software is supposed to go, right? So, yeah, I don't, I, I think it's, there's so much left, right, to solve, and it's, you know, it's hard, but they're good challenges, interesting challenges along the way. Um, I think the computer is becoming much more part of everybody's daily life, and so I, I like the fact that it's having a bigger impact that's more, I guess, more global. Um, you know, when you worked on software as an enterprise dude, maybe you made 300 people that, you know, company X happier because you deployed your enterprise software to 300 people. You know, now you can sit in your living room and write a, you know, an Android app and deploy it to 50 million people, you know? So, yeah, it's a different world and you have that kind of impact. Um, so, yeah, but writing software has not gotten that much easier. I think we handle more data. I think we solve some harder problems. So maybe that's just the nature of it is we keep, as it's kind of Moore's law in reverse, like, yeah, the, the computation keeps getting better, but then I keep eating it up with the things I can think about doing to solve that. So I don't see any end of that. Still difficult, so I guess that's good for us. Yeah, right. you got a job, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for a long time. Uh, all right, super awesome question to finish this up. Um, so what do you think about when the software is asked to work with devices that are invisible and all around us? You have know, the internet of things and the environment and sensors and all of that. So the yeah. question was about the internet of things and Things talking to other things. You know, I think, you know, at some level I am chewing on that problem. I mean, it's kind of what I got with this mobile data at some level of scale. Um, so, yeah, I think that problem is going to continue to get bigger, and you need to figure out how to, how to deal with that kind of information. But, um, you know, that's probably, you know, the eight or ten year problem. <laughs> And I think we'll inch into it with some of the stuff we're doing. Like, you know, a place like you, we look at certain data sets that are going to become available. Like inside retail stores are now going to build, you know, closer tracking where you can see what aisles people go up and down. So that's a different level of resolution than I had before. Uh, inside the home, at and you know, producing, you know, now sort of the security system and, you know, probably even the Zigbee-esque, you know, home automation. So I'll actually have all the data set of people opening their fridge and turning on their TV and, whatever they do at home, right? So we kind of see it as this interesting model where we hopefully can just kind of be adding these data sets into what we do and slowly kind of digesting that information. All right, now last question. last question. You promise? Yes, I promise. Okay. Nobody else can ask any questions. Except for you. Uh, when you're hiring people for technical leadership role, so what attributes do you look for? What attributes do you feel distinguish distinguishes technical leaders mm -hmm. that are like amazing and can grow into like huge CTOs or whatever? Right. From people that are very confident and do their job, but not necessarily the ones that you want to start the next startup. Right. So you gotta be technically on top of your game, that's important, but critical is you've got to know how to accomplish things through other people. Because you're never going to build anything more. Yeah, you know, there's the occasional guy who's going to write the iPhone app in his basement, and five million people will use it, and you know he'll retire off that. But most of these endeavors become larger companies. Larger companies require a decent set of people to get together and work on a really hard problem and figure out how to work together. So somebody who's done that before is who is who I hire, right? Who's done that, but um, who has those skills and kind of thinks about the people element of writing software, which is actually the more challenging part than writing the lines of code. Um, so they're sensitive to those soft skills and to the challenges of coordination and communication and, you know, how do, how do I really make a team work together well every day? And so, in order for you to become a better technical leader, of course, please come to future sessions of CTO School. Yes. Yeah. what we are sort of about to help you uh, think about issues and learn to become better technology leaders. Uh, so with that, I want to thank uh, Stephen for sharing a lot of his experiences and career. And, uh,
Well, thanks for having me.